July 2nd, 1971, Paris. Jim Morrison is one of the most famous rock and roll singers in the world. Quintessential American rock star, it's Jim Morrison. Jim had them unholy screams from the other side of the universe. He's also the ultimate sex symbol, the self-styled Lizard King. At that time, he was the most beautiful man in Hollywood and probably anywhere else on the planet. Every guy wanted to be him, and every girl wanted to go to bed with him. But he's a superstar at war with his own dark demons. He was saying, help me, help me. Nobody knew how to do it. Jim had a darkness, a uh, darkness in his writing, a darkness in his, his life. And soon, that darkness will finally consume him. This is the last 24 hours in the life of Jim Morrison. Paris, France, July 2nd, 1971. It's 5 a.m. and Jim Morrison is fast asleep. He's been in Paris for the last four months, living in a neighborhood known as the Marais. And in just 24 hours, he'll be dead. Morrison has sublet an apartment at 17 Rue Bautreuil. He currently shares it with Pamela Corson, who, for the last five years, has been his on-again, off-again girlfriend. Morrison has come here primarily to escape, both from the pressure of being a rock star and from the possibility of doing jail time in the US, where he's been charged with indecent exposure and public profanity. Jim Morrison is also in Paris in search of artistic inspiration. So when he went to Paris, it was the idea of here is a new place, a place for artists, a place I can work on my poetry. I mean, what better place to write poetry than in Paris? And I can explore new avenues of my thinking and in his mind, I think, get himself together. Paris seems to have had a positive effect on Morrison. He looks healthier and happier than he has in years. But appearances are deceptive. Although he's only 27, years of drug and alcohol abuse have taken their toll. It's a far cry from four years earlier, in 1967, when a spry Jim Morrison, accompanied by his band The Doors, roared onto the music scene, determined to conquer the world. Their self-titled debut album was released and became the first of seven consecutive gold albums recorded by the band. That first album reached number two on the Billboard charts, putting The Doors in the same league as The Beatles and The Rolling Stones. Stylistically, the Doors were different from other bands in the California surf and folk rock scene. With their raunchy blues, they stuck out like a sore thumb, or more like a middle finger. The band's road manager was Vince Trainer. You had to be there. It was electric, it was emotional, it was riveting, fascinating the dynamics of a Doors performance simply swept you off your feet. Someone who got to know Morrison intimately was rock groupie Pamela DeBar. Never seen anything like it before. It, it was sensual, it was rude, it was naughty, and it was just so, so thrilling, really. The Doors were along those lines, bands that were clearly talented uh, enough and adventurous enough that they did not necessarily follow someone else's formula. Some more, you know, jazzy. One of the reasons that the Doors music holds up and that it's still popular today had to do with the fact that they have a classic sound. They didn't adopt the trends of the day. Jim, Jim, eight bars keep Their sound has that fresh quality to it. And part of it, I think, is the fact that, you know, Jim had something to say. Jim. Jim's lyrics communicated things. 
they were so visual beyond the obvious that they took advantage of their knowledge of and their interest in uh, the visual arts so that they really did break on through and present themselves the way very, very few rock stars of that era had even thought to do. And so I think those are significant contributions from Jim Morrison. There were a lot of bands of that era that were basically feel-good, happy, hippie love movement type things. Jim had a dangerous quality to his work, and that gave his music a relevance that a lot of people didn't have. But The Doors' music wasn't half as important as Morrison's killer good looks. This was something that didn't go unnoticed by the VP of their record company, Steve Harris. I took a good look at him and thought, if this kid could read the phone book on key, we're all gonna be very, very wealthy. More dangerous than Elvis, prettier than Mick Jagger, it was clear that the band's greatest asset was Jim Morrison. Jim had this love for movies, and so he would emulate Greta Garbo. He had the look in the eyes of uh, Marlena Dietrich staring you down, shaking his head and his hair like Marilyn Monroe did. He had those masculine traits with the feminine wiles. That's what made Jim unique. He hypnotized his audiences, screeching like a shaman. He even invented an alter ego, the Lizard King. He was called the Lizard King for a reason. I mean, he did slither and he did move sort of reptilian-like and beautiful body, beautiful face. Jim Morrison became the face of the doors and the face of sex in rock and roll. There was a shot that I named the young lion. He just looked magnificent in it, and it was used in the village voice. The village voice said, there is a new sex symbol now, and his name is Jim Morrison. But although he soaked up the attention, Morrison was unhappy with the focus placed solely on his looks. He saw himself as a writer first and a singer second, desperate to be taken seriously like his poet heroes. He didn't like the image of the sex symbol. He wanted to be seen as a philosopher, as somebody who could write poetry, who could deliver this poetry to a live audience and have their reaction. That's what Jim wanted. But what Jim wanted was not what he got. His rock god image eclipsed any chance he had of being taken seriously as a poet. The failure of that dream would eventually chase him to Paris, and in 19 hours, will finally push him over the edge. July 2nd, 1971, Paris, France. It's 11 a.m., and Jim Morrison only has 18 hours left to live. He's come here to Paris, a city rich in arts and inspiration, to write poetry. Sick of his rock star image, he's determined to make his mark as a serious poet. But lately, he's had a bad case of writer's block and is feeling anxious. Alain René, an old friend from Morrison's film days at UCLA, drops by. Alain René and Jim Morrison had been friends since film school. They did not hang around together a lot during Jim's rock star days. But then when they were in Paris together, they spent a lot of time. And they were good friends, they went way back. René notices that Morrison is restless. He suggests they go out for a walk and grab some lunch. Jim doesn't look too well at all. They stroll along the colorful Rue des Rosiers, not far from Morrison's apartment. Here, he is rarely recognized and is free from the pressure of playing the rock star. In this bohemian Jewish neighborhood, Jim Morrison seems to fit in perfectly. But throughout most of his life, that has rarely been the case. Jim Morrison was born in the small town of Melbourne, Florida on December 8, 1943. He and his family were forced to move often because of his father's job as a Navy officer. By the time he turned 16, Jim had already moved nine times, making it difficult to make friends. Tandy Martin was Jim Morrison's high school sweetheart. Jim used to be in the basement of his house painting. 
And he stayed down there a lot, painting and writing, and we spent a lot of time down there. As a teenager, the bright student became more and more disruptive in school and at home. His father, a strict disciplinarian, cracked down hard on Jim. His parents had no idea what to do with a kid like Jim. No idea. How could they? Nor could his straight-laced parents understand their son's fascination with the dark underbelly of literature. I think in the eighth grade, he had a copy of Allen Ginsberg's Howl. I mean, you have to put that into perspective. People weren't reading that stuff in the eighth grade. No way, or ninth grade or 10th grade. Jim was not like other people. He just wasn't like other people. It's the classic teenage angst. Kids growing up and saying, gee, the world is not all fluffy and nice the way mom and dad have been telling me. There's something dark, something sinister, something dangerous about it. And Jim reflected that in everything he did. At 19, Morrison's inability to fit in finally got him in trouble with the law. Some people just rebel because they don't really know what else to do. But Jim was an original, for good or ill. In Tallahassee, Florida, he was arrested for stealing a helmet from a police car, resisting arrest, and for being drunk and disorderly. In junior and senior year, I think that's when he started to drink. In alcohol, Morrison found the perfect fuel to feed the flames of his one-man rebellion against the police, against his strict father, and against everything in between. Yeah, I think he had a problem with authority. Absolutely. On reaching adulthood, Jim wasn't done rebelling. His father had expected him to follow in his footsteps and join the military. Instead, in 1964, Jim headed to California and enrolled in UCLA's film program. So deep was the insult that after university, Jim and his father would never speak again. Jim often referred to his parents as being dead. Uh, in his mind, they were dead to him. When I looked at his bio right after he signed the contract, and he, it said his parents were deceased. And so that's what I thought. But in 1967, Harris received a call from a woman claiming to be Jim's mother. He gave her the address of a hotel where her son was staying in New York City. Later, I told Jim what I did, and he said to me, Steve, do me a favor and just don't ever, ever do that again. I don't want to be in any contact with them at all. I think the fact that Jim was alienated from his family is reflected a lot in his writing. He writes from a position of being an alienated, lonely person. Strolling along with his friend Alain René, Jim is momentarily distracted by a cut glass Star of David dangling in a shop window. He decides to buy it for his girlfriend, Pamela Corson. For the successful rock star, money is no object. But just five years earlier, he'd been flat broke. In 1965, as a 21-year-old film student in California, Jim Morrison started partying heavily on Venice Beach. Inspired by the wild hippie scene, he spent his days and nights smoking pot, dropping acid, and writing poetry. One day on the beach, he met fellow film student Ray Manzarek. Ray asked Jim what he'd been up to, and Jim said, well, I've been writing a lot of poetry, and I've been working on some songs. And Ray said, really? Well, sing me one. And Jim sang Moonlight Drive. And Ray said, wow, that's some of the best lyrics I've ever heard for a rock song. Uh, how would you like to get together and, and work on some things? So he got John Densmore, he got Robbie Krieger. They came together, and Jim began to sing. They called themselves The Doors, based on a poem by one of Morrison's heroes, William Blake. Morrison's own poetry set to rock music soon caught the attention of locals. They became the house band at the infamous Whiskey A Go-Go, where their shy lead singer often performed with his back to the audience. But that shyness soon gave way to Morrison's budding love affair with the Spotlight, and the Spotlight loved him right back. The press loved to write about him, and, you know, he was a good-looking guy. 
With Jim Morrison at the wheel, one rock critic dubbed the Doors the missionaries of apocalyptic sex. And Jim made sure he lived up to his sex god image, even backstage before a show with super groupie Panda Bar. <laughs> We found a loft of some kind where they were storing old lighting equipment and stuff. It was somewhere to make out. And I said, I'm making out with Jim Morrison. I'm making out with Jim Morrison. <laughs> so we did that for a while. And it turned out that the show was starting. And he went, oh, oh OK. And he went scrambling down the ladder and running out onto the stage. <laughs> the special attention given to Morrison began to create tension within the band. I think there was a little bit of resentment in that they were a unit in the way that they wrote, in the way they created. The songs were uh, credited to all of them. But after a while, Jim got more and more and more of the attention. This idiot DJ in Los Angeles who began to talk about Jim Morrison and The Doors, as opposed to The Doors, whose lead singer was Jim Morrison. The Doors didn't like it, they tolerated it. Soon, even Jim Morrison would be unable to tolerate his own rock god image. He would run all the way to Paris to escape it, only to find peace at the ultimate price. July 2nd, 1971. For the last three hours, Jim Morrison and his friend Alain René have been strolling through the streets of Paris. Throughout their walk, René has noticed that his friend appears shaky and unwell. Several times, Morrison breaks out in violent spasms and a bad case of the hiccups. The rock star, however, insists he's OK. But in less than 15 hours, he will be far from OK. Around 2 p.m., they reach Place de Vaux, the city's famous Renaissance square. René feels that a little food may help settle his friend. But throughout the afternoon, the hiccup attacks continue and seem to be getting worse. A life of excessive drinking has finally caught up with Morrison. The cracks have been showing for years, even in his earliest days with the doors. Alcohol was his drug of choice. I mean, he did other drugs here and there, but mostly it was alcohol. One of the reasons that he would drink so much is because he liked the experience of not being in control and not worrying about it. Wasted and completely out of control, Morrison became increasingly destructive in the recording studio. The rest of the band were not amused. As the band's popularity soared, Morrison spent more and more time in bars. One of his drinking buddies was his bodyguard, Tony Funches. Barney's Beanery. <laughs> That was the prototypical lunatic English roadie, two-fisted drinking bar, clown's den madhouse that ever existed in L.A. But me and Jimbo managed to get ourselves 86 out of there. He was so staggeringly drunk, and you just didn't know what he was going to do. Rock and roll lifestyle. We were stinking drunk all the time. <laughs> When every time he came into New York, we used to go to a bar uh, around Columbus Circle. The bar was about two or three city blocks long with a mirror behind the entire bar. And Jim said to me, you know, I could take this bottle and throw it through that mirror and smash it, and I won't feel any remorse at all. Could you do that? And I said, no, I would feel remorse which led me to believe that somewhere in the background there was a sociopath. There was one night at the whiskey, and uh, he reached over and just whacked me across the face, just slapped me across the face for no reason at all. No reason. What happened is he would get stone drunk at the moment's notice. He had no warning, nothing leading up to that to let him know when it was coming on. He'd be fine, he'd be sober, he'd be articulate, and then he'd be wild and nuts. And part of that is an allergic reaction to alcohol, which is a, a documented thing that people have now, but they didn't know what it was then. If Jim were alive today and were performing the same way, everyone would say, Jim, you got to get into a program. You got to stop drinking. You got to take care of yourself. You got to go to a 12-step program. You got to go to a rehab. 
You're going to die if you continue this. Then it was, oh, you know, Jim, <laughs> he drinks too much. People don't want to think about this or remember this, but he was almost a pariah at one point in Hollywood. Yeah, he, he would say, oh, God, here comes Jim Morrison. And I remember one night, too, coming out of the whiskey, and this was pretty typical. He was laying on the ground in the gutter in front of the whiskey, like, you know, trying to go to sleep. And there were people, you know, sometimes people would come along who weren't strip regulars and go, whoa, and I, that's Jim Morrison. And they'd try to help him, you know, and they would, he, just, he didn't want to know. Morrison's heavy drinking was getting more dark and more violent. It was also directly affecting The Doors' live shows. During 1969, the performances degraded steadily. The alcohol became more prevalent. The singing became less dynamic. Uh, the shows lost their vigor, lost a lot of their sparkle. As a band, The Doors had a problem. Not only was their singer stealing all the headlines, he was now sabotaging their live shows. It's too damn bad that he couldn't keep his act together because when he was good, he was excellent. And when he was bad, he was terrible. Hey, what are all these people doing? Oh, I hate people. And now in Paris, lunching with his friend Alain René, the years of hard drinking have taken their toll on Morrison's health. In 13 hours, he will draw his final breath. After lunch, Morrison and Ronay browse through a film shop. Since film school, Morrison has had a passion for the cinema, having recently made a movie called Highway. The film, a dark, impressionistic journey through the desert, was inspired by a troubling childhood experience that has stayed with Morrison throughout his life. A key event in Jim's childhood, and in fact, the thing he referred to as the event that shaped him, uh, occurred when he was four years old. The family was driving between Albuquerque and Santa Fe, and they came upon this horrific accident. A truckload of Indian workers had overturned, and Indians were dead all over the highway. Morrison believed that the spirit of one of those Indians, a shaman, entered his own soul and stayed there. He claimed it affected his writing. He claimed it affected the way he did the, the concerts, uh, that there was always this soul, this Indian shaman, pushing him to these experiences. Those experiences were later expressed by Morrison in the form of dark, mystical poems, poems that the Doors used to set them apart from other bands. But for Morrison, Rock and roll was only a short-term vehicle for his poetic vision. He looked at his rock and roll world as a temporary stop, because he was a poet, and he saw himself that way. And he dragged his poetry books everywhere he went, and he thought this was just a temporary ride. And in 1969, to prove it, he self-published a limited edition book of his poetry and sent copies out to friends but the response was less than overwhelming. You know, there's initial reaction, a negative reaction by the established literary community that, you know, is like, oh, rock star, you know, so I'm, that created some tensions. It's tough for a pop star or a rock artist to be taken seriously as a poet, especially when they themselves use that terminology. Jim Morrison, I think, welcomed it more than the others and therefore got vilified for it. Desperate to be seen as a serious poet, Morrison decided to dismantle his rock star image. He asked that his bare-chested young lion photos not be used for promotional purposes. He grew a bushy beard to hide his pretty face and gained an alarming amount of weight. Guy could grow a Rasputin Russian winter beard overnight as a hairy son bitch. He definitely put on weight. Part of that was drinking all the time. But also, he was becoming uncomfortable with having to live up to that, you know, sexy young rock and roll image. And in the summer of 1971, Paris is where Morrison has come to escape that rock star image and to refocus on writing more poetry. He's lost the beard and some of the weight but years of alcohol abuse have caught up with the frustrated poet. His afternoon walk with his friend, Alain René, brings him back to his rented apartment on Rue Beautreilly. 
Even though it's July, he brings up firewood. Climbing the stairs, he suddenly collapses out of breath. Jim Morrison is only 27, but he suffers the aches and pains of a man several times his age. And soon, the pain will end. He has less than 12 hours left to live. July 2nd, 1971, 6 p.m. For the past four months, Jim Morrison has been hiding out in a rented apartment in Paris, on the run from his rock idol image and trying to establish himself as a serious poet. He spent the day with his old friend, Alain Rene. It will be the last day they ever spend together. In 11 hours, Jim Morrison will be dead. When Rene tells Morrison that he has to leave for a dinner engagement, the singer begs him to go out with him for one more drink. Morrison may have turned his back on his public, but he's not ready to be entirely left alone. You know, there's a, a great quote about fame that says, it's not satisfying, but it's addictive. And that's true. What happens is you get used to that attention. Jim was very used to that attention. So in Paris, not having as much of it, I'm sure there was a, a little bit of loneliness, a little bit of isolation. But in 1969, as a member of The Doors, Jim Morrison was still very much the center of attention in all the wrong ways. Although his band was as big as the Beatles and Bob Dylan, his drinking and antisocial behavior was now completely out of control. It drove a wedge between him and the other members of the Doors. But instead of toning down his wild ways, Cigarette? he blamed his problems on his rock god image manufactured for his fans. And on one particularly hot night in Miami in 1969, Morrison crossed another line this time driving a wedge between himself and the people that had made him a star, his public. Jim had been drinking. He had seen the stage performance in Los Angeles the night before where the whole cast was nude. And I think he decided to test some limits. As if to mock his sexy image, Morrison removed his shirt, threatening next to take off his trousers. Now, Ray, knowing Jim's unpredictability, knowing that Jim had been drinking, said to me, Vince, don't let Jim take his pants off. I put my fingers in his belt loops, and I put my arms against my hips and lifted. In fact, it's a wonder his voice didn't go up an octave. Taking their cue from Morrison, the audience stripped down to the buff. The audience followed suit, where more than 50% of the audience was actually naked. The authorities were not amused. The Crime Commission, I'm calling upon the Dade County Grand Jury and the State Attorney's Office to immediately take criminal action against the group known as the Doors, and we are demanding that action this day. A few days after the show, they charge Morrison with lewd and lascivious behavior, a felony, even though many claim he never removed his trousers. The guys couldn't tell they were looking at their instruments, and Jim doesn't remember whether he was... Uh, whether he did or he didn't. I am willing to state here unequivocally, Jim did not in any way, shape, or manner take his pants down, open his pants up, or expose himself in any way. It was physically impossible for him to do it. But whether he did or not, he was of special interest to the FBI, who'd been keeping close tabs on him for quite a while. They saw Jim Morrison as a menace to society. In research for my book, I obtained the FBI files on Jim Morrison. Now, a lot of that is blacked out. But suffice it to say that the FBI was definitely interested in Jim Morrison, monitored his activity, and had him on a watch list. The FBI's interest in Morrison was maybe less about public nudity and more about his anti-war lyrics on songs like Peace Frog and The Unknown Soldier. I think also in Jim's lyrics, the fact that he called for revolution regularly, the fact that, you know, he was pushing people to the idea of a revolution. In Jim's mind, I think it really wasn't a conscious, social, organized revolution. It was more an individual revolution of breaking away from the conditioning of society and your parents and trying to come to a new and different reality on your own. And Jim was all about that. If 
political means uh, upending society and changing rules and uh, fomenting uh, different kinds of revolution than the Doors and Jim Morrison were absolutely political. But in July 1971, as a rock and roll exile in Paris, Jim Morrison seems hardly a threat to anyone but himself. As he drinks with Elaine René near Place de la Bastille, an enduring symbol of the French Revolution, the only rebellion brewing is the one that's violently raging through Morrison's body. His attacks suggest he's suffering from acute respiratory distress. He had had difficulty lately. He had spit up blood a few times. He had uh, had some other problems, respiratory problems. Some of this went back to an injury he had, uh, jumping out the window at the Chateau Marmot in, in, uh, in L.A. and uh, uh, doing a Tarzan act off a drain pipe and then falling and smashing off the shed of the place and injuring himself. Morrison should be looked after in a hospital. Instead, he's busy ordering yet another beer. His friend, Elaine René, announces that he has to leave to meet a friend. They will never see one another again. In just 10 hours, Jim Morrison will dabble in more than just alcohol, and it will cost him his life. Shortly after Elaine René leaves, Jim meets up with his girlfriend, Pamela Corson. To the outside world, they look like a typical couple in love, out for a stroll in one of the most romantic cities in the world. But since first meeting back in 1966, their relationship has been anything but typical. The pair first met at a club on Sunset Strip called the London Fog, where the doors were the house band. Morrison called her his cosmic mate, and dedicated poetry and songs to her. And that remained constant and genuine. It did not, however, in the process, make him monogamous. Jim's wayward ways got him in trouble when he was caught red-handed with rock groupie Pamela DeBar. I was a cute young girl, and it was 1967. It was Laurel Canyon, and Jim Morrison was next door, and it was really, you know, a very exciting moment. So I walked in. And there was Jim. And he turned around to me and he said, whoa, get it on. That's what he said a lot of time. He said, get it on, instead of hello. And so I was like naked there on his floor and he was leaning over me. And just as that was going on, Pam walked in. She has good timing. So she promptly kicked me out. Beautiful and strong-willed, Pamela Corson didn't take Morrison's infidelity lying down. Their fights were the stuff of legend. Their relationship was very wild, tempestuous. They pushed off against each other. There was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, wild fights and things like that. To buffer the fighting, they kept separate homes. Morrison stayed at a motel near the Doors headquarters, while Pam lived at a house on Laurel Canyon, immortalized in the Doors song, Love Street. In their own strange way, they had found love. And I don't think they ever really thought about being with somebody else on a permanent basis. I think that, you know, they knew that they were the love of each other's lives and they would always come back together. But for all the comfort that Pamela brought her boyfriend, she had her own demons, a nasty addiction to heroin for one. Many thought her unstable and a bad influence on an already troubled Jim Morrison. She was a junkie. Uh, in fact, it was the cause of a lot of stress and fighting and arguing with Jim and a lot of his drinking. She was probably the worst influence on his life. But tonight, as they make their way into a Paris movie theater, they're the picture of domestic bliss. They've come to see a film recommended by their friend, Elaine René. Renee suggested that he go see uh, Pursued, a, a movie that uh, starred Robert Mitchum, and Jim liked Robert Mitchum. So they, he went, he wasn't that impressed with it from what Pam said later, but you know, it was all right. But in seven hours time, nothing will be quite all right. The young couple's domestic bliss will turn to tragedy, and the world of rock and roll will lose one of its brightest lights. <laughs> Thank you.
July 3rd, 1971, 1 a.m. For the last four months, rock star Jim Morrison has called Paris home. He's come here to write and to rest, but his stay has been anything but restful. He's made himself increasingly sick by indulging in a steady diet of whiskey and beer. And tonight, in his apartment with his cosmic mate, Pamela Corson, he decides to go even further. He takes heroin. Up to now, Morrison's entourage has worked very hard to keep the hard stuff well away. I don't tolerate smack, pure and simple. So everybody knew that it could be dangerous to them to bring that stuff out. Uh, Uncle Tony will not be amused. Somebody's going to get hurt. Guaranteed. But tonight, Uncle Tony is thousands of miles away, and no one's there to look out for Jim. Over the years, Pam got involved in different kinds of things and eventually started using heroin. Now, this was something Jim was concerned about. It's not something he condoned. It's not something he really approved of that night, whether it was just the idea of something he wanted to try, just pushing the envelope, whether it was some depression, he had been very reflective lately, whatever, he tried the heroin. That decision will prove to be fatal. Stoned out of their minds, Pam and Jim watch home movies of recent vacations. Between reels, they snort more heroin and spin some old Doors records. But in just three hours, the music will be over. Before his exile to Paris, Morrison had been forced to face a different kind of music, felony charges stemming from the Miami concert. So severe were those charges that they deeply affected the band and, as usual, it was all about Jim. Well, in the realm of art and theater, I, th I do think that uh, there should be complete freedom for the artist and performer. Everybody's nerves were on edge. Would he behave? In many places, police were there with a warrant for Jim's arrest. In fact, for the arrest of the whole group, if he so much sneezed the wrong way. Booking stopped. Uh, concert promoters uh, no longer wanted to have them because of the fear of arrests and lawsuits and violence and mayhem and breaking obscenity laws. Jim Morrison and The Doors were not prepared for the backlash that followed. Radio shows would not play Doors records. Doors recordings were removed from the shelves of record stores. We were absolutely banned from all public media. Once the darling of the press, Jim Morrison became public enemy number one. He was ridiculed by Rolling Stone magazine with a wanted poster that called the Miami concert Jim's organ recital. When people started looking at him as a drunken fool, that devastated him. Uh, basically, you know, Jim wanted to be wild and crazy on stage. He did not want to be seen as a fool. But worse was to come. In September 1970, after awaiting trial for nearly two years, James Douglas Morrison was found guilty and sentenced to 60 days hard labor for profanity and six months hard labor for indecent exposure. Allowed to remain free on bail pending an appeal, Morrison, the free-spirited bohemian, was terrified of doing time. In his darkest hour, he became increasingly obsessed with his own mortality. Then when Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin died, Jim began to go around and say he was number three. Jim was always saying things like that. On July 3rd, 1971, in his apartment in Paris, Jim Morrison is well on his way to becoming the next rock and roll casualty. At 3.30 a.m., after passing out on the couch from too much heroin, his girlfriend, Pamela Corson, wakes up to find him struggling to breathe. She manages to rouse him. She wants to call a doctor, but Morrison refuses. Pamela, still high from the heroin, goes off to bed. Jim Morrison isn't ready to join her quite yet. Instead, he heads to the washroom where he draws himself a hot bath. 
it will be the last thing he ever does. Seven months earlier, back in the States and with serious jail time hanging over his head, Morrison became ever more distant from those around him. In concert, he was barely able to perform. In December 1970, on stage in New Orleans, the Lizard King completely fell apart. He stood up, picked up the microphone, stand, and proceeded to smash it through the floor, literally smash a hole in the floor. He then walked off the side of the stage, the stage right, went up to the dressing room. That was the end of it. For years, the other members had put up with Morrison's antics, but this time, he'd gone too far. Drummer John Densmore had seen enough. John tossed his sticks on the floor and said, that's it, never again. The decision was, we will never perform in public again. We will never go on stage again. But while they'd never played together live again, the Doors continued to record. They began work on their sixth album, L.A. Woman. But recording alone was not enough for Jim. He lived on performing. How else could he get the word out about what he thought if he didn't tour? How else was he going to get his message across? How else was he going to be able to bring the gospel of St. Jim to the crowd? I think he, he began to think, well, I've got to get my life together. Maybe going to Paris, I can come up with some new things. I can define myself more as a poet. I can get away from the things causing me trouble, and, uh, you know, I'll start anew. But if Morrison's move to Paris was the beginning of anything, it was the beginning of the end. At 4 a.m. on July 3rd, 1971, his girlfriend, Pamela Corson, wakes to the sound of Morrison throwing up in the washroom. Sick to his stomach, he's throwing up blood. Again, Morrison refuses to call a doctor. When his nausea finally passes, he tells her to go back to bed, that he will soon join her. But he never quite makes it. Instead, Jim Morrison slips quietly into unconsciousness. Paris, July 3rd, 1971, 6 a.m. As the city slowly comes to life, Pamela Corson suddenly wakes up. The night before, she and her boyfriend, Jim Morrison, partied the night away, snorting heroin. And now, she wonders why he never made it back to bed. She finds him passed out in the bathtub. His nose and mouth are crusted with blood. She tries to wake him, but he doesn't move. And at first, she thought he might be joking around with her because he did stuff like this all the time. So she stayed in there and watched, and he didn't move. He didn't move. Because she can't speak French fluently, she feels unable to call an ambulance. Instead, she phones Jim's best friend in Paris, Alain Rene, and asks him to call one for her. Before the medics get there, fireman Alain Raison arrives. When we entered the bathroom, I saw the body of a man, the head thrown back. The water, it was just a little bit pink, because I think he must have bled. The rescuers have no idea that their patient is, in fact, Jim Morrison. The water was warm, so the body was also warm, which led us to presume that maybe he was not dead. They rush Morrison's still warm body out of the tub to discover he's only warm because of the tepid bathwater. Very quickly, we became aware that, in fact, he was dead. The time of death is estimated at around 5 a.m. The death certificate states that he died of apparent heart failure. Citing no foul play, the authorities see no reason for an investigation or to order an autopsy. 
Jim Morrison, one of the most important singers of his era, is dead at 27. Many do not buy the ending to the Jim Morrison story, leading to a flurry of mysterious theories. Some say that before Pam Corson called Elaine Rone about an ambulance, she called her heroin dealer, who came to the apartment and advised Pam to flush the drugs. Soon after, that same dealer hightailed it out to Marrakesh to avoid legal hassles. Others say that Jim had been out partying the night before he died at a Paris nightclub where he OD'd in their bathroom. Fearing being tied to his death, the nightclub had Morrison's body carried back to his apartment and dumped in the bathtub. Others still believe Morrison staged his own death and is still alive somewhere, having finally escaped the image that had troubled him so. You know, there's all this talk about Jim faking his own death, and he promoted those rumors because he talked about doing it, because Rimbaud had done that and had disappeared and wrote his great works, you know, up to when he was 18, 19, and then disappeared in Africa. And that's what Jim Morrison talked about doing. I always thought the real testimony to his mystique was the fact that so many people believed maybe he hadn't really died. One of the greatest, I think, proofs that he didn't fake his own death is the fact that could Jim Morrison stay out of the spotlight 40 years? I don't think so. Not the Jim Morrison that I've learned he was. Jim Morrison is buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, not far from Henri de Balzac, Marcel Proux, and Oscar Wilde. Every year, thousands of fans continue to visit his gravesite. It had been really important to him to be known as something more than this rock icon, this so-called lizard king. And I wrote the obituary at Rolling Stone. I thought, why not issue the rock thing on the headline and have him go out as what he wanted to be known as, James Douglas Morrison, poet. Mm -hmm. 